The tragedy was much greater, but here the pressure is relentless and it's day after day, week after week, month after month. Uh, so there are a lot of ways this, this pandemic is putting more stress on society and on the economy. I'm very excited to announce we have uh, John Berry with us today. Uh, he's an author, professor um, of our prize winning The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, and also author of Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America. Um, he's had numerous TV appearances and uh, has advised both the Bush and Obama administration on the pandemic playbook. You know, first question that we have here is, is really, this book came about, you wrote it, you know, in 2004 is when it says it was published. And um, I've seen that took you about seven years or so to write. So what really inspired you to write this book? Well, it was almost an accident. Uh, I always had a lot of interest in uh, science and medical research, but I was actually planning to write a book on the home front, World War I, culminating in... Uh, events in 1919, which I still think is one of the most interesting years in American history. And uh, I live primarily on an advance for the publisher. And that book I thought would take me seven to 10 years to write. And uh, figured if I broke off a book that I figured would take me two years to write, I could subsidize a larger uh, project. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Influenza book turned into a seven year project. So it didn't quite work out the way I had planned it. Uh, these things happen. And I might say, you know, I, I do have a title of professor, but I don't teach. So I'm a full time writer. So seven years is it's a long time to work on a project. What advice would you give to college students who are undertaking some type of writing journey? It sounds like don't give up, you know. Um, well, that's true no matter what you're doing, you know. But it's always one of the most difficult decisions to make, whether you're a writer or a scientist or doing anything that's original and creative. When things aren't working, you have to figure out, is this something that you should walk away from uh, before you and waste your life on it? Or is it something that you can solve if you persist? And, you know, that can be a very, very difficult call uh, in terms of advice to somebody starting out. Number one, I think you should really, if you're talking about a book, you certainly need to love what you're getting into because uh, that's, a, that's a pretty deep commitment. Uh, you know, if you're talking about writing uh, an article, a nonfiction article, something like that, that's a lot easier. Uh, it's more a uh, skill and well-defined uh, project you can uh, start on. But a book, that's, that's, that's a little bit different and, and requires a much greater commitment. You know, when I, when I was reading the book, you, ha you went into such detail and depth with, you know, I remember... It almost kind of brought me to tears when you talked about the macaroni box where, you know, a woman kind of walked out and made sure her son was buried with the macaroni box. How, you know, this was all before Google really exploded. How were you able to go into such detail in the archives as, you know, to get information to write the book? Well, that one was actually, uh, you know, I got lucky that um, there, most of the interviews with survive, you know, the book focuses and I, I hope most of the people watching, I know they were supposed to read the book and so forth. So I hope they did. <laughs> uh, but for those who didn't, you know, most of the book focuses on the scientists because what I write and try to write about is power. People who had some kind of power over the course of events and uh, in something like a pandemic, that's a scientific community. Uh, as well as politicians. But I certainly 
do in some places go into individual stories of, of tragedy. And frankly, for most of those, uh, came from the American experience, which had uh, done a show on the pandemic uh, while I was researching the book. I knew those people. They had done several shows uh, on the other, you know, I've written six books. You mentioned one of them, uh, Rising Tide. They'd done a couple of shows based on that. Uh, and they gave me complete access to all the transcripts of all the interviews uh, for, their, for their influenza pandemic show. Uh, much more than what they put on the air. Uh, so that, that was just a great courtesy from them and much appreciated and added a lot to the book and also saved me a tremendous amount of time, frankly. Right. So in, in shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, a lot of our kind of viewers have read the book and, and some haven't. So could you talk a little bit about the Paris Peace Treaty um, and Woodrow Wilson getting influenza and um, how do you feel this incident shaped history? Well, one of the uh, major complications of the 1918 pandemic, and it's also true of COVID to a somewhat le lesser extent, although the full extent is not yet known, uh, was neurological. Uh, there were several comprehensive reviews of the pandemic, which concluded that second only to damage to the lung, there were there were impacts on uh, neurological processes, including thinking. Uh, and even today, we're we're hearing about this, this deep fog or brain fog, rather, with with COVID. Uh, it was much more serious in 1918, 1919, or could be. Uh, in fact, the people Oliver Sacks wrote about in The Awakening, uh, who were comatose, really pretty much. Uh, they were uh, supposedly victims of the 1918 pandemic. Anyway, Wilson did get sick in the middle of negotiating the peace treaty in, in Paris in the spring of 1919. And influenza was, was rampant in Paris at the time. A young aide of his died. Uh, his wife got sick. His his closest, most senior aide, House, Colonel House, uh, got sick. In fact, his obituary ran in American newspapers, uh, although he recovered. Um, anyway, Wilson had held firm on all these principles that America, uh, he said, was going to war over 14 points and basically anti-imperialism, make the world safe for democracy and so forth. and he had even threatened to leave the press, the uh, peace conference, return to the United States because he couldn't get the British and French prime ministers to go along. And he gets sick. Everybody around him, everybody who dealt with him, uh, said that his mind was never the same. He got paranoid. He thought their French had spies in the furniture. He thought he was responsible for the furniture. There was all so, sorts of strange goings on. He, he literally couldn't remember an hour later what decisions had been made uh, an hour before. Uh, you know, Herbert Hoover, who was in Paris at the time, although not part of the delegation, uh, he was involved in feeding Europe, uh, handling logistics. Uh, Hoover commented that uh, Wilson's mind had always been sharp before he got sick, but suddenly uh, it just wasn't functioning. Uh, Lloyd George, the uh, British Prime Minister, commented on Hoover's complete spiritual and mental breakdown in the middle of the conference. This was clearly a result of influenza. And after this uh, attack of the influenza, he caved in on almost every point that he said America had gone to war over. Uh, and uh, he was negotiating in his sick bed. He was too sick to go back to the negotiating table. So Clemenceau, the French prime minister, whose nickname was the Tiger, give you a sense of his personality, was in the room browbeating Wilson. Wilson caved in. 
Wilson himself said if he was a German, he wasn't sure he'd sign the peace treaty. Uh, and historians are pretty much unanimous that that peace treaty, because of its punitive measures, all of which Wilson had opposed when he was healthy, uh, was a major contributor to the rise of the Nazis and hence to World War II. Now, you can't absolutely prove that Wilson wouldn't have caved in on everything if he'd stayed healthy. But there's nothing in Wilson's history, nothing about his personality, uh, which suggests that that would have been the case. Quite the contrary. Uh, he, he was uh, pretty insistent upon his way or the highway uh, for essentially his entire life, really, uh, up until he got sick. So it sounds like the influenza had a, a pretty big shape on potentially the future outcomes of society. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about the importance of telling the truth. Uh, and I think that was one of the major takeaways of the book. So how important is telling the truth to the public in a pandemic? And in your opinion, um, what were the biggest mistakes made in 1918? And then now what are the biggest mistakes in 2020 by our governments, our community and people? Well, the same, that they're not telling the truth. You know, we didn't, uh, the, in 1918, and there was a lot of fake news in 1918, but the fake was that they were repeating what the government was saying. Uh, the motivation in 1918 was very different. We were at war and, and Wilson didn't want to do anything that might detract from the war effort. So totally unrelated to the pandemic, he had created something called the Committee for Public Information. Uh, and the architect of that community wrote truth and falsehood are arbitrary terms. There's nothing in experience that tells us one is superior to the other. All that matters is the impact of what you're saying. So this is a propaganda arm, which its goal is to generate patriotic fervor. And they had 100,000 what they called four minute men who would get up in front of every public gathering, whether it was a vaudeville theater or a school board meeting and give a very brief uplifting speech. And uh, you know they banned songs like, I wonder who's kissing her now from army camps because that was bad for morale. You think, well, your wife or girlfriend's out there uh, with somebody else. Um, at the same time, they passed a law that made it punishable by 20 years in prison to utter, write, print, or publish any scurrilous, abusive, disloyal language about the former government of the United States. And they enforced this year law. They sent a, they sentenced a congressman to prison for 10 years. Um, so you had the carrot and the stick. You had the, the propaganda arm and you had the punishment. And that, that again, was to uh, enhance patriotic fervor, really fury almost. Uh, you know, they changed sauerkraut, you know, uh, to Liberty Cabbage. Schools wouldn't teach German, things like that. So that was the context that already existed. And then influenza came and it just fell into that infrastructure. And as a result, you had national public health leaders saying things like, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was referred to as Spanish flu, uh, although it didn't start in Spain, but it picked up that name. And uh, you have nothing to fear if proper precautions are taken. And these things were repeated by newspapers who knew better uh, all around the country, uh, almost universally. There were a very, very few cities uh, where the media and public leaders uh, were more candid, uh, but very few of them. Uh, and the result was that people exposed themselves to the disease uh, who might otherwise have survived. Uh, most cities, almost all of them, but not quite all of them, uh, ended up doing many of the things that we're doing now, you know, or have done now, uh, in terms of closing, you know, bars and, you know, schools and so forth and churches and so forth. Uh, but 
in most cases that occurred too late. Uh, you know, those things could have been done sooner. They would have saved a lot of lives. And in fact, they would have helped the war effort because more people would have been capable of functioning. One of the big differences, remember, between 1918 and today is the virulence of the virus. Uh, 1918 was much, much more deadly than what we face now. And it also killed people who were much younger. The peak age for death was 28. And in fact, over 95% of the excess mortality with people younger than 65. So it's a reverse today. So 1918 had a very dramatic effect on everyday life. People could die 24 hours after the first symptoms. Uh, it, you know, so everybody knew from day one, this was not a hoax. There was nobody in 1918 who didn't know how deadly that disease was. Um, so that's also a major difference between uh, then and now. Certainly there are people around, including possibly some members, uh, some people watching right now who don't think COVID-19 is such a big deal. Uh, it is, but it's not what 1918 was. And where, where would you see, you know, the government's failing in, in 2020? Uh, well, you know, the same thing. Obviously, we now know that February 7th, I guess, uh, Woodward recorded the interview with Trump in which Trump said, this is deadly stuff. It's airborne. You know, it's nothing like influenza. And he learned that nine days before that or 10 days before that in a briefing on January 28th. Plus, let's not forget, on January 24th, China closed down Wuhan, a city of 11 million people. That's got to get your attention. You know that China is taking it seriously when you're trying to close down a city of 11 million people. Imagine cutting off New York, closing all the roads out of New York couldn't get in or out. So, and, you know, but that was too late. I mean, half the, half of Wuhan, over 5 million people had left before that. Before China. Anyway, the, the point is that in late January, Trump knew everything he needed to know. He didn't know everything we know now, but he knew everything he needed to know. And he went out and lied about it and downplayed it, and people have died because of his lies and his other mishandling of the pandemic. Uh, and the irony is, I think he would have run one reelection if he had done a better job with the pandemic, including just telling the truth. Merkel in Germany, her approval rating hit 77% the highest of her entire political career because she addressed the pandemic in a serious way. And the only time Trump's approval rating in his entire presidency cracked 50% was in mid-March, right after, a few days after he said, we're at war with the virus. People rally around leaders, but you know, he walked away from it. His, his, political antenna were, you know, did not serve him well. If he had addressed it, instead of trying to minimize it, he probably would have won re-election. Yeah, I mean, the lying is just unacceptable, you know, and I think I, I, I want to kind of continue on here. And, you know, you talk in, in the book, you talked a little about how San Francisco, you know, talked about wearing masks and how they credited the masks. But then you say that the mass didn't necessarily work. Um, we're receiving, you know, there's this whole kind of debate and friction of. Well, I can I can cut off. Yeah, I know where you're going, and it's a different virus. Early in the in this pandemic, I was among those who said masks aren't going to do you any good. Uh, but the data changed, and the difference is, in influenza, you do not have. You probably don't have any asymptomatic transmission at all. You do have pre-symptomatic transmission. 
but it lasts for a relatively short time. And in influenza, your incubation period is one to four days. I mean, most people get sick at two days. So even if you have pre-symptomatic transmission, you're talking about a few hours. And as I say, you don't have any asymptomatic transmission. In this virus, you have, you know, nobody knows the exact number, but it's quite significant. And a lot of the cases are caused by exposure to people who have no symptoms whatsoever. And, you know, probably at least 40%. And, you know, who don't know they're sick and therefore are not, aren't taking any precautions. And you also have pre-symptomatic transmission. Your, your peak virus load is, is right around the time you get sick and shortly before and after, and that's for a two-day period. So the masks were not effective in 1918 because the mode of transmission, although they're both airborne droplets and so forth, that's, that part's identical. But the period during which you're shedding virus is different. And also, frankly, the masks, back then they were, uh, as a general rule, uh, they were recommending gauze masks, which are, you know, simply aren't going to catch as much virus as, as a higher quality mask. Uh, but it's primarily the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. So, you know, I, I don't think masks are the be-all and end-all, but they definitely do prevent transmission, not 100%. You know, just wearing masks all by itself is not going to solve the problem, but they are a very important piece of solving the problem. Now, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about how the primary people who were impacted um, in the 1918 pandemic were, you know, younger. I think it was something around 30 or so or 38 or so. Why were the younger generation, you know, hit so hard uh, in 1918 compared to now? It seems like they've been completely skipped. Well, we, we don't really know for absolutely certain, uh, but I think the most uh, plausible hypothesis, and I think the one that's got the most uh, support, is that, you know, your immune systems are different. It changes over time. It's strongest when you're younger and the immune system tended to overreact. Uh, and that created the cytokine storm, uh, which people are dying of now. The irony is today, younger people tend to have immune systems that are strong enough to fight off the virus. Older people may get, as a general rule, sicker or people with some comorbidity, but their weaker immune system, it's not strong enough to fight the virus off entirely, but it's strong enough to create this overreaction. You know, the immune system has a lot of very, very deadly weapons it can throw at you or at an, an, you know, a pathogen in the body. And in 1918, the battlefield was the lung. And it was destroying the lung to, uh, you know, uh, to try to beat the virus. You know, I think most people, in 1918, probably died of bacterial pneumonia following influenza. Uh, but it was much the same process. The, in, in, in those cases, you know, the uh, influenza <clears throat> just opened the way uh, for the bacteria. Uh, even today, with the best antibiotics, uh, Bacterial pneumonia following influenza has an 8% case mortality rate. That's pretty high. Uh, and of course, in 1918, without antibiotics, it was uh, three to four times that. Um, but, you know, the, the, those combinations of things, either directly from the virus in the cytokine storm or the virus destroying your protections that would normally stop a bacterial pneumonia, uh, th those two things. Wow, so almost like people's immune systems were almost killing themselves in a way. Yes, and as I say, that's, that is happening today, it seems to be happening today, although there is another hypothesis, something called the Brady-Kinnon uh, uh, pathway that uh, might explain 
some of it, but we don't want to get into that here. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, in, in this whole notion of it, it impacting the 1918 pandemic, impacting the younger, younger generation a lot more than it may be perhaps the, to the COVID-19 today, um, there's a lot of, you know, some evidence is starting to emerge around domestic violence, mental illness, you know, suicide completions are all on the rise. Um, how do we balance the needs of those most impacted by COVID-19 compared to those who would otherwise be fine but are now suffering due to prolonged uh, social distancing guidelines? And I, I put this in the context of very seriously, we had a real tragedy on our campus a couple of months ago where we had a grad student who was murdered uh, by her ex, you know, but through domestic violence. And so uh, we've definitely felt it here in our own community. And, and so just how do we balance that, you know, uh, the needs of our Kapuna, our, our elder community members versus the needs of our, you know, younger generations. Look, the, the, that's a real issue. There's no question about it. I ask myself practically every day, isn't there a better way of handling this? And I mean, it, it, it's very, very difficult. The, the, you know, I, you know, the so-called Great Barrington Declaration and the herd immunity approach I think they're asking the right question. There's no, they're definitely asking the right question. Isn't there about a way to handle this? But they're coming up with the wrong answer. The, the downside uh, of, of pursuing that approach is, you know, just, I think, unacceptable to anybody who really looks at it. Uh, but I think there's no question that COVID-19 is putting more stress on society because of the duration that we're under pressure than the 1918 virus did. There was much more tragedy in 1918, a lot more people dying. But again, one of the big differences between the two viruses is duration. As said earlier, that you know, influenza's incubation is one to four days. Uh, and you know, when the first wave hit, people were calling it three-day fever, and you get up and what you're done. COVID-19 is not like that. You know, the incubation period is two to 14 days. You're sick longer, you shed virus longer, everything's stretched out. And that has created much more stress on society. In 1918, influenza, probably two thirds of the dead, and we're talking about 50 to 100 million people, adjusted for population, that's 225 to 450 million people today. So a lot. So two, two thirds of the deaths, occurred in about 14 or 15 weeks in the fall of 1918. And it's an incredibly short time frame. And in any particular community, it was shorter than that. It would hit a community and be gone in six to 10 weeks. So six, seven, eight weeks, and the virus has disappeared. We are, you know, the intensity and the tragedy was much greater. But here the pressure is relentless and it's day after day, week after week, month after month. So there are a lot of ways this, this pandemic is putting more stress on society and on the economy. Uh, you know, is there a better way to handle it? You know, I mean, we've already handled it so poorly. You know, we're now, yesterday was 145,000 deaths. Uh, cases, excuse me. You know, we're headed toward 200,000, more than that, per day. Uh, you know, that's an extraordinary number. It's very difficult to get control of it when the numbers are so large. If we had done it right the first time, it would be an entirely different story. You know, it's, it's not only Asian societies like South Korea that did it right and have essentially no cases, or Taiwan where, you know, I mean, China where people, I'm, you know, China completely controlled it, but China's an author authoritarian society and they spy on you. They can, you know, they were literally locking people, putting locks on the outside of doors so people couldn't get out. We can't do that here, and nor should we be able to. But, and you can argue South Korea, which is a democracy and a free, free country, uh, but maybe their culture is different and 
But Australia is a lot like the United States. And they have completely contained the virus. They've done it right. You know, they have plenty of independent thinking people. They have cowboys and, you know, everything else that, that we have. So you, you can do it right using these public health measures and getting your economy back. And remember, the, the restrictions are not what, have dis, what has destroyed the economy. It's a pandemic that destroyed the economy. Yeah. There is no regulation preventing people from getting on airplanes. Right. But nobody's getting on airplanes because they're afraid of getting sick. Right. You take care of the pandemic and people go to airplane, get on airplanes. I'm not going to go eat inside a restaurant. I'm not going to do it. You know, I, it's, it's too risky. Uh, you take care of the virus and all that comes back. I can't wait to get back inside a restaurant. I live in New Orleans. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's famous for its food. Right. I'm tired of taking out restaurant food. Uh, get control of the virus, and then the economy comes back. It's, it's not either or. There was a study by uh, uh, the University of Chicago, economists, one of the most conservative economics departments in the country, which looked at two and a quarter million businesses. And they looked at it in areas where there was, you know, uh, they were right on a border either between a state or different counties which had different regulations, some more strict than others. And they compared the economies and they concluded that only 7% of the economic collapse was because of government regulation. 93, the rest of it was because of consumer behavior. It had nothing to do with the regulation. So again, take care of the, econ of the virus and the economy will take care of itself. You know, in, in kind of going on this direction a little bit further of, you know, how much this has impacted our society for a prolonged period of time. You know, in the book, you talk about how Vaughn believes society came close to an end. Um, can, you know, like I said, we have some viewers who've seen the book, who've read the book, others who haven't. Can you talk a little about, you know, Vaughn's comments about, um, and, then, and then how does that compare to where we are today? with that kind of whole notion of civilization at its breaking point? Well, you know, fortunately we're not, we're not reaching that now. Uh, in 1918 and the cities hit hardest where people were lied to the most, like Philadelphia, which I wrote about at, at considerable length. Uh, you know, things were pretty bad. I think society is based on trust, when you break that trust, then it's everybody for himself or herself or your own family, and that's all you care about. You can't rely on anybody else. You don't care about anybody else. And in most disasters, people come together and you see the best of humanity. And there were certainly plenty of heroes in 1918, but you saw a lot more of the worst of humanity than you did the best. And, and Philadelphia, when they were calling for volunteers, they couldn't get anybody because there was so much fear. Uh, you know, Philadelphia was a place where I say talking about lies and saying there was fake news, but it was news that the government wanted to put out there. When they finally, belatedly, at a time when they were using steam shovels to dig mass graves, they finally closed schools and businesses. And one of the newspapers actually said, this is not a public health measure. You have no cause for alarm. <laughs> Who did they think they're kidding? How stupid did they think their readers were? This is that you're closing all the schools and right. But it's not a public health measure. Right. I mean, come on. So as a result, you had people who starved to death because they couldn't. The volunteer agencies couldn't find anybody to bring them food. And uh, this same thing was occurring in rural areas too, not just a big city like Philadelphia. You know, I see so Red Cross reports that, that said the same thing in rural Kentucky, for example. So society began 
to fray. Uh, and, and also in Philadelphia, you know, I, I quoted a, uh, uh, well, he's actually a med student then in charge of an emergency hospital. He became a prominent cardiologist later. Uh, but he lived 12 miles from his hospital he was working at. And he saw so few cars on the road, he eventually, he counted them. He started counting them. One night, his way home, 12 miles, third biggest city in the country, he didn't see one other car on the road, not one. He said the life of the city is almost stopped. So around that time, you mentioned Victor Bourne, who is a very serious, sober scientist, dean of the University of Michigan Medical School before the war. He, during the art war, he became a colonel in the, in the army. But he wrote, if this current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth. So that's what he was talking about, this complete breakdown of society that you seem to be on, on the verge of. But I do think that was a function of people being lied to, along with, of course, the stress that they were put under. And uh, you know that's why I juxtaposed it with San Francisco, one of the few places that did tell the truth, where you know the mayor, the business community leaders, trade union leaders, and the public health leaders all jointly signed a statement. Huge type in the newspapers said, wear a mask and save your life. Now, whether the mask did or did not do any good has nothing to do with it. It's the wear a mask and save your life is a very different message from this is ordinary influenza by another name. You have nothing to fear. Uh, so San Francisco functioned. And San Francisco was, was as hard hit almost as Philadelphia. They were like the fourth and fifth hardest hit cities in the country. Uh, so it was, you know, in terms of deaths, it was, it was just as hard hit as Philly, but it functioned. You know, there when, you, when they closed schools, teachers volunteered for as ambulance drivers, risking their lives as opposed to running away and hiding and not being able to find a volunteer to bring food to somebody who's starving to death. So the messaging is important. <laughs> Telling the truth is important. People can handle the truth, but you need to tell it to them. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple questions here coming in from the audience and uh, I want to kind of um, get a chance to answer them. And so I have one, one additional question I have is, you know, I teach statistics and you talk about this notion of the virus evolving and becoming more deadly. And then you say it reverts back to the mean, you know, what do you think, where are we at with COVID-19 and in, in terms of the mean of lethal, you know, lethality with it? Well, fortunately, they're very, again, very different viruses. Uh, influenza mutates much faster, much faster than covid you know, there has been some talk of mutation of COVID, uh, but there's no evidence that it's become more virulent. There's a suggestion that, and I mean no evidence, uh, no reason to believe that it will. Uh, there is a suggestion that it may have become one of the mutations that seems to have taken hold, may have made it more transmissible, but that's not clear. Uh, and again, I'm not a virologist. I did, you know, talk about that, but that's speculation. Uh, I talked in terms of COVID, I certainly uh, talk to a lot of people and I read a lot of papers, scientific papers. And, you know, there, there's, you know, I'm not saying it couldn't, it could, you know, become more virulent, but there isn't the slightest hint of that happening anywhere in the world and literally tens of thousands of the viruses have been sequenced, tens of thousands by now. And, and so that doesn't seem to be on the horizon, thank God, because obviously if you had this transmissibility and more variants, then, then we really would be in for it. 
Um, you know, in, in one of the kind of chapters that really struck me was when they started implementing the, uh, the various like treatments. One of them, I remember they were talking about, in, you know, inputting hydrogen peroxide intravenously. Right. Yeah. I, you know, looked at hypothesis testing and, and that. So, um, yeah. and then but, the doctor who did that thought it claimed success. Half is, I forgot the exact number, but it's like 13 patients seven lived and six died or seven i forgot if it was seven died and six lived or six you know they're the reverse but it was almost 50 50 not quite but he wrote an article and i think it was in journal of the american medical association claiming success yeah. uh, it's a bit of survivorship bias there yeah, yeah. Um, my my student wanted to know um, I would like to know how is it possible for doctors and physicians to keep their medical licenses even after making those false claims that their treatment worked? Well, he believed it, so it wasn't necessarily a false claim, and uh, or at least he didn't think it was. And JAMA published it, which is where I learned it. I can't, I think it was JAMA. I mean, I read, you know, the medical journal articles that, that were being published at the time. It's it would have been a reputable journal if I, I, I don't specifically remember the footnote, but I, I think Journal of the American Medical Association. So they found it worthwhile to report and they, they didn't attack the guy for it. You're desperate, you're trying everything, uh, which has been the case here. There are, there are a lot more strictures now uh, about your justification for trying something experimental. You know, that didn't exist in 1918. Uh, but we're, we're still pretty desperate. We've tried a lot of things that, that haven't worked, but we've also Im improved care because many of the things that we've tried, including things as simple as instead of putting somebody on a ventilator, laying them on their stomach, uh, which has saved a lot of lives. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, we have standards and you have to have reviews and so forth before you try a really uh, experimental theory. But the hydrogen peroxide thing, I mean, he reasoned that that would add, that would oxygenate the blood. Right. Uh, you know, you're dying because you don't have any oxygen in the blood. So he had a theory behind it. Uh, but now before something can be tried on a widespread basis, certainly, you, you, you know, you like to think you don't have political pressure on the FDA and hydroxychloroquine and so forth, which, you know, hurts more than it helps. Uh, it doesn't help at all, and it may hurt you. You know, somebody, you know, they tried things like convalescent serum in 1918. Uh, didn't work in 1918. Uh, it turns out it doesn't work now, although it's been tried in a very uh, pretty widespread attempted logically it would try it so it would work logically but but it doesn't a lot of things that should work sound like they work make sense that it would work but they don't work right uh, what are your thoughts about this you know the Pfizer vaccine you know just announced of 90 percent success rate and you know I'm a, I'm a dad uh, I have a small you know six-year-old it's um, I love and adore the most precious thing to me. And, you know, I think I have skepticism, you know, skepticism. And so what are your thoughts about, you know, with all this political pressure, what are your thoughts about the... Well, I, I trust uh, the FDA. I, I trust the advisory board. I mean, now that Trump has released that pressure, uh, you know, the, there is an advisory board. Those are very good people. I trust their judgment. And, and frankly, at this point, I, I trust the FDA. Uh, I would not, I might have had some questions uh, um, with Trump exerting all that pressure. But Han, uh, Stephen Han, the director, did in the end stand up to it. He kind of bowed on hydroxychloroquine. But that drug has been in play for, for years for lupus and, and, and so forth. So it was a well known quantity. Uh, being put to a new use. It's a little bit different from a, a new drug. So yeah, I, I'd certainly be okay with that. I'd, I'd line up for a vaccine. Uh, incidentally, the Russian vaccine, which didn't go through the testing 
uh, that would be required in the United States. They approved a vaccine and they are claiming 92% effectiveness. I think there was a paper in the last few days. Uh, we still need to examine that data. Um, but, you know, one of the th things earlier when I was saying that the virus, the COVID doesn't seem to mutate, doesn't mutate nearly as fast as influenza. The spike protein, which is the target of almost all the vaccines, uh, you know, that seems pretty stable. Influenza, the antigens that the uh, influenza vaccine aims at happens to be part of the virus that mutates very, very rapidly. Uh, so that's why you don't get those kinds of effectiveness uh, rates for an influenza vaccine. So, you know, everybody's optimistic. There's still a lot of questions. You know, does that simply prevent, does the 90%, does that simply prevent mild disease? What does it do to severe disease? Does it really cut down on severe disease? You know, uh, we don't know yet. So, and it is a little bit, you know, 30,000, I think uh, Pfizer is more than that. I forgot the exact number. I think it's about 48,000 for their uh, vaccine. You know, as large a number as that is, when you start giving it to millions of people, you know, it's very likely some, some side effect will, will surface that may not have shown up with 48,000. There's a big difference between tens of millions and 48,000. Uh, well, you're a statistician, you know, Right. Number every possible event, if it is possible, it'll it'll come up. So I would guess there are some possible negative side effects, but considering the risk of COVID nineteen, and it is risky to get that disease, even if you're young. Uh, you know, people who have no symptoms at all, you still have measurable damage to the heart and lungs. It's very common. We don't know whether that means you're going to get a heart attack when you're 28 or 38 years old or be incapacitated in some way. Uh, we just, or whether you're going to heal completely. We, we have no idea. That's another reason why the herd immunity idea, I think, makes no sense. Because we do know that people with mild disease, with, I mean, it doesn't matter whether they have mild, severe, or no symptoms at all. There's still measurable heart and lung damage and probably and damage to other organs. And to essentially run in it, you talk about the safety of vaccine, you're running an experiment if you want herd immunity with several hundred million people and you have no idea. You know that there's damage, but you don't know how long lasting and what the repercussions are of that damage. That, I, to me, is irresponsible. Sure. So we have a question here from our audiences. Um, you know, uh, what was your experience like advising the past president, starting with Bush, and how did this start and what happened? You know, I, I read there's a story that Bush, somewhere I might have read that he picked up a book and then all of a sudden couldn't put it down. And so can you share a little bit about that? Well, that is, I mean, that story is, is accurate. Uh, an assistant secretary of HHS at the time, Stuart Simonson, who is now assistant director general of the World Health Organization, uh, was very interested in pandemics, very concerned about pandemics long before my book came out. And my book did come out. He handed the book to Mike Levitt, then the secretary of HHS, and told him he needed to read it, that we needed to prepare for a pandemic. Uh, and uh, Levitt read it and took it to Bush, and Bush read it and uh, made it a very high priority uh, for his administration. As a result, I did get involved in the sort of the conceptualizing of a pandemic preparedness plan with the Bush administration. You know, not they have actually quite a detailed plan with all sorts of triggers. You know, of course, it's been just, I don't know if anybody in the Trump administration ever bothered to read it, but <laughs> it's a pretty good plan. Uh, now, you know, it's, it, you know, intellectually challenging, flattering. Uh, in the, in the uh, 
Obama administration when uh, 2009, H1N1, sort of the pandemic that wasn't surfaced. I, you know, I was in uh, pretty routine conversation with some people who had become friends of mine in, in the White House. Uh, you know, they'd asked me what I think about some things that, you know, may have played some role in getting some uh, change in policy on school closings. I was actually more in favor of keeping them open uh, than closing them. Uh, mostly, actually, in 2009, I was forwarding information. That I was getting emails from scientists all over the world uh, uh, with, with data, uh, which their governments were not making public. And I was providing that uh, to the White House uh, so that it could find out what was going on elsewhere in the world. That was probably the most important thing that I did wow. in 2009. So basically all these scientists from across the world were being censored in a way and you were able to kind of serve as a communicator yeah. to yeah. the administration. So it was a back channel. I remember I actually learned of the pandemic from somebody in a lab in San Diego before there was a word about it publicly. Uh, and uh, I think the first cases that were uncovered were actually in San Diego, not in Mexico. Uh, although it's not, you know, it seems like it probably did start in Mexico. So clearly, you know, the Trump administration failed, um, especially in how it lied to the public about the severity early on. What should Biden do on day one? Um, and then how might this pandemic have a lasting impact on us? Well, you know, he is, he's already addressed it and he will continue to address it. Uh, you know, take the advice of public health advisors. Uh, everybody get on one page. It's easier said than done. You still have some uh, governors who are very reluctant to do anything. You know, he's uh, no doubt he's already announced. You know, you make masks, masks mandatory on federal property. Uh, he doesn't have the legal authority probably to do much more than that, but the, that is a bully pulpit. And, uh, you know, if you can get, I would assume he would, he would bring some Republicans on stage with him. Uh, even Mitch McConnell on masks probably agrees with Biden. I don't know that for an absolute fact, but he's, McConnell certainly said he's, for masks and and so forth. So if you get some bipartisanship up there, that would help. Uh, we still have so shortages of PPEs. Remarkable this far along that we still have shortages of PPEs. Uh, but he would use the uh, uh, Defense Production Act to move that along. He's already made clear he will do that. Uh, He's already made clear that he will create a commission uh, on testing. Uh, the testing is very important to know where you are and know where the disease is going. Uh, the problem is when you're having 140,000 cases a day as yesterday, and if it's going up, you know, you need to get the case count down significantly before you will be able to test and trace, isolate, quarantine, and so forth. Uh, you can't do it with tens of thousands of cases a day. You don't have the personnel and the infrastructure. Uh, but there will be a much more coordinated plan. There will be uh, guidance to schools. Right now, it's almost every school board, and in some cases, every school for itself is gonna make its own decisions without very clear guidance. That's laughable. You know, there will be much clearer guidance. Uh, I, things will improve dramatically, but that doesn't mean that the case count is going to go down dramatically right away. There is a long lead time. Then you've got the issue of uh, lockdowns. You know, uh, I know one of his advisors uh, is uh, is one of the people on that 12 person task force, at least one, and there may be more, one that I know of is uh, recommending a lockdown, thinking that otherwise you're just never gonna get control of it. And of course in Europe, 
Europe is a real puzzle. You know, Europe, Italy, where things were so bad early, got it down to 200 cases a day, 60 million people. It's under 200 cases a day, 60 million people. But now there are, you know, tens of thousands of cases a day. How do you go from 200 a day to tens of thousands? On a per capita basis, they're, they're where we are. And they had looked like they had gotten such control of it. It's, I mean, the virus is out there. And then, let, you know, that's the thing. It's, it is a long, grueling fight. You have to maintain your discipline every day. And you relax and it comes back. So, you know, you mentioned earlier in, in China, they could literally put a lock on your door here. You know, uh, there's a lot of politics, you know, and, you know, I think our audience, Paula asks, is how, you know, how does Biden overcome the media and the resistance and the, you know, kind of the negative politics of putting each, you know, blaming the other party or whatever it may be? And, you know, it's going to be difficult. You know, Trump's not going away. Uh, Trump is not going to shut his mouth. Uh, but you might be able to get, as I said, McConnell, who's the leading Republican in office, I guess. Uh, you know, it would be nice if you get McConnell and nobody who knows who Kevin McCarthy is, but he's a House Republican leader, maybe McCarthy, who's pretty hard line right. I don't know where his position is on mask, actually. Uh, but Mike DeWine, the Ohio governor, is Republican. Uh, who's been quite aggressive on this, uh, you know, get, get some prominent Republicans stand next to you and, and make it, it's not bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. The virus doesn't give a damn if you're a communist or if you're a, a neo-Nazi. This is nonpartisan. And, and, you know, Try to get that out. I, you know, I don't know what tone Fox is going to take. You know, uh, the main networks, they, they, and CNN, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS, uh, they're all going to, I think, you know, share the message on, on social distancing and masks and so forth. Uh, you know, what's Fox going to do? I don't know. Well, we're out of time here. Um, thank you, Mr. Barry, and so much for your time. And, and you know, you've made clearly a, a very large impact on society and the world. And your book really had an impact on me and, and the students also. And so thank you so much again, um, Mr. Barry, for volunteering your time. This was, this was excellent. You're welcome.